our final book in this year's Lovecraft series and we are going out big. Most of the books we've read this month have made casual nods to Lovecraft or directly engage with his work. But Ruthanna Emrys's Winter's Tide is the first one to take on his mythology and turn it into something new. At the same time, confronting the racism and grounding it in history. Afra and her brother Caleb are the last of the Deep One's children. Originally, their village of Innismouth was a peaceful place of learning where their people grew up, studied, and eventually grew into their final Deep One farms before living under the sea. But the US government got it into their heads that the people of Innismouth were quietly worshipping their gods, studying their magic, and living out their lives were a threat to the country and put them in desert concentration camps. One by one they all died of starvation, hunger, and lack of access to the sea, until the US government found a new public enemy, the Japanese during World War II. By this point, Afra and Caleb were the only ones left of their village, and when the Japanese people were finally released, Afra and Caleb were released too. Our story begins a few years later. Afra is learning magic with her friend and employer Charlie when the government comes a knocking at her door again, this time asking for her help. Ron, a government agent, believes that there is a way to right old wrongs and seeks out Afra's help to deal with a possible Russian spy who may or may not have discovered a body switching spell. They know if that's the case, the US could be in deep trouble. He also promises that by helping him, it will give Afra some access to the Innismouth books that were stolen by Miskatonic University when everyone in the village was removed. Afra finds herself drawn into the mystery and agrees to help, but quickly becomes tangled with another government team who believes in a more forceful approach to magic and does not believe that she's not a threat. She's not alone though. Charlie, her brother Caleb, and her adopted sister Nico join her. And she also reaches a mutual understanding with Ron, as well as with a Yith taking over a professor's body, and a local girl named Audrey who wants to learn magic. Together they become a found family, and it's one of the most adorable and heartwarming aspects of the book. They are all in some ways marginalized by society. Ron is gay and Jewish, Charlie is gay and disabled, the Professor Trumbull and Audrey are women in academia, and Neko is Japanese American. Winter's Tide has a large cast of side characters, more than most books, but each character feels grounded and feels like a separate entity with their own histories and reasons for joining up with Afra. You're never going to get them mistaken or confused with anyone else. And they work well together, bringing in different perspectives and skills. Emerson's inclusion of marginalized characters is obviously a big leap forward from the original source material. Afra's people are described as ugly, grey, lumpy, and inbred. And Lovecraft is a notorious racist and his writing is chocked full of notorious racism. So using his work to highlight the injustices and use his magic system as a point of strength for characters marginalized by society is a wonderful repurposing of his schlock. Suck it, Lovecraft! And one of the best parts of the novel is just how deep Emrys goes into the Lovecraft world. I mean, of course, you have the hallmarks of a Lovecraft story with Miskatonic University, Innismouth, and Cthulhu, but she also goes deep into the mythos, including the origins of the Yith, who are historians of the universe, the Lovecraft origins of humanity, and the future of the Earth. I don't know how much of this is what Emrys appropriated from Lovecraft and how much of it was originally Lovecraft. I mean, having the Deep Ones included under the banner of humanity doesn't seem like something Lovecraft would do, but I don't really care. Her world is great. I found myself loving, like actually loving Lovecraft's world and wanting more of it, or at least Emrys's non-racist version of it. It's so fascinating and cold and wonderful. The back of the book's description of this story is a bit misleading. Sure, their adventure starts out with them trying to track down a Russian spy, but the team never really gets close to solving the mystery. Instead, they get sidetracked dealing with the problems the second government agency team creates when they try to tromp around taking the aggressive approach to ferreting out the spy. It's interesting how off course this book gets, but you never really notice because you're having fun the entire time. We ended up having different opinions about the pacing of this book. I found that at points it kind of dragged in a little bit and then slowed down. But I didn't have any problems getting through it. So I think it just really matters what you're expecting and what you like. And either way, Emrys' writing is beautiful and the book is completely enjoyable. Overall, you're going to love this book if you enjoy great world building. Even though the story is based off of Lovecraft's world. Emrys does an amazing job of tying together all his stories and fleshing out the things that Lovecraft only hinted at. 
and the found family aspect of this story is one of its best features. So if you've been looking for something interesting and thoughtful to read or are interested in exploring more of Lovecraft's universe, we recommend checking out the series. Because yeah, there is a sequel. Hopefully one where they find that Russian spy. <laughs> That's it for Lovecraft Month this year, but we will do another one next year, and remember, Lovecraft was the monster all along.